بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أمير المؤمنين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة يا 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 ويا باب نجاة الأمة فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لن تنالوا البر حتى تنفقوا مما تحبون صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى states in the Holy Quran بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم you shall not achieve righteousness until you spend and you give from that which you love. Allah is the all truthful. Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Our societies recently have witnessed unparalleled advances in science and technology. In the history of humankind, we have not witnessed such scientific progress as we have seen in the last decades. However, one of the byproducts of all this advancement, of this science, of this technology, is that we, as human beings, we have become more materialistic. One of the modern ills of society is the disease of materialism. Our severe attachment to this world, to the materialistic aspect of this world. When we examine our societies, we see that they are based on spending. All we do is spend and spend and spend. Our economy is driven by consumerism, consuming products, buying. We live just to buy products. And when you examine how much we spend, it is truly shocking and alarming. Canadians spend every single year $195 billion on food, beverage, and tobacco products. Now when you look at the Americans and how much they spend, Americans spend $96 billion just on alcohol, on beer, alcoholic beverages. They spend 60 billion, 65 billion US dollars on soda, on these types of beverages. They spend $52 billion on pets. Imagine, $52 billion on pets. $35 billion on gambling, $25 billion on professional sports, $25 billion on chocolate, $17 billion on video games, $18 billion on Valentine's. Valentine's Day in February, you know how much Americans spend just on that day? $18 billion. Do we even know what these figures mean? If you look at all the food that we waste, Americans waste every single year 
170 billion dollars worth of food. Fresh food going into the trash. Canadians, they waste 31 billion dollars of fresh food that goes and ends up in the bin. We see that our society is based on spending. Our economy is based on spending. Now this has made us very materialistic. In today's modern society, we live a very materialistic life. We adopt a very materialistic lifestyle. Our youth, the young generation that are living today, they are more concerned with material objects, with money, with material goals than they are concerned with helping society, with contributing, with working. If you ask an average teenager what they're concerned about, we see that most of their concerns are materialistic concerns. And this is a big problem in our society. Why is it that materialism is so strong? What is it about materialism? The reason why materialism is so strong and it has such a lure to it is because it fills a void in us. We human beings, we have a void. Materialism attempts to fill this void. But the problem is it never leaves us satisfied. The more we indulge in materialism, the less we are satisfied. It's like filling a sieve with sand. It never gets full. That's the problem of materialism. And by the way, when we think of materialism, don't think that materialism is an issue that affects the rich only. No. Materialism affects the poor as much as it affects the rich. Everyone's impacted by materialism and the dangers of materialism. There's an interesting aspect of our brain, how it functions, that makes us interact with materialism. When you see, for example, a product that you like, there is something that you're interested in buying. Do you know what happens inside your brain? When you see something you're interested in, there is a part in the, in the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Now this is where you have the pleasure center in the brain. When you see something that you like, you know what the brain does to you? It drugs you. Yes, it does drug you in a way because it floods your brain with dopamine. And that's why you get this feeling of excitement just at the thought of the thing that you want to buy. You feel excited. You feel happy. You feel as if you've achieved something when you still haven't even purchased it. You still haven't used it. You still have not benefited from it. But interestingly, this is what the brain does. Now you would think that with all this spending that we have, the US, the richest nation on earth, with all this spending, you would think that we should be a very, very happy nation, right? Because that's what we're supposedly told or that's what most people think. They think that the more you have, the more you spend, the happier you're going to be. Well, if you look at the World Happiness Report, you'll find that the United States, it's the wealthy, wealthiest nation, the most nation that spends on earth. They should be the happiest on the list, right? They're not. They come at number 14 on the list. There are 13 nations who are ranked to be happier than the U.S. Why? And by the way, the reason why the U.S. does relatively well, I mean being 14 out of 200 countries, that's not bad. There is a fundamental reason we'll get to it. Why? But from a materialistic standpoint, they should be the happiest nation on earth because they have the most wealth and they're spending the most. But that's not the case. Canada, for example, comes number seven on the list. It's not the happiest nation on earth. So what does this teach us? All this money... All this wealth, all this spending, is it really making us happier or not? It's very interesting how the human being functions. You would think that the more money you have, the more options you have, the happier you are. The more content and satisfied you are. But that's not the case. 
Research shows otherwise. When you have too many options, you're left less satisfied. You know, there was a, a study done on people with various types of food that were presented to them. One group of people, they put on the table 10 types of food. Delicious, wonderful, fabulous food. The other group of people, they put only two types of food in front of them. Two or three types. Now, who do you think after eating and enjoying the delicious meal, in the end, who do you think was more satisfied? What does research show? This is not some claims that I'm making. What are scientists saying? Research demonstrates that those who enjoyed only two types of food in the end, they left the meal more satisfied than those who had 10 types of food. Now, not in this blessed Husseiniyah. All the types of food we have here makes us more satisfied, inshallah. But generally speaking, you think it would leave you more satisfied? Think twice. Spending more, having so many options is actually not making us human beings happier, more content. And we experience this on a daily basis. I mean, how many of you have went through this? You're looking for an item, for anything. You're looking for something, for a product, something that you need. You go on Amazon, and you put the name of the product that you're searching for. And then once you click search, what happens? You get like 500 results. And you're looking at the screen, you're trying to figure out what the best product is for you. You spend sometimes hours looking at all these different products. Then you go into them. You read the re reviews, what people have said. And you read contradictory reviews. Some people praising it. Some people are saying, stay away from this product. It's not good for you. And then you realize you spent three hours on a simple product. You did end up buying one, but you're not that satisfied. Subhanallah. All these choices... 500 search results, 500 types of product that you need. But that is not making you more satisfied. You know, 20 years ago, when you needed an item, you just go to the store, you see one, you pick it, you go home, and you're satisfied. Now, with all these new varieties, in reality, you think you're more satisfied. The brain tricks you into thinking you're more satisfied. But after a while, you realize, you know what? All this is not making me a happier person, a more content person. So materialism does not guarantee us happiness. Yes, scientists have demonstrated that people who suffer from poverty, if you can't make ends meet, obviously you will be in distress. Scientists have been able to demonstrate, researchers have been able to demonstrate that if you're making more than $50,000, so about 70,000 Canadian dollars, that really will not make you any much happier. Because you need this amount for you and your family to meet your basic needs. The human being must meet his basic needs to be happy. There's no doubt about that. If your basic needs are not being met, you're not going to be happy. Your family is not going to be happy. But anything over your basic needs, and research demonstrates anything more than, let's say, 70,000 Canadian dollars, anything more than that, making more than that, is not necessarily going to make you happy. Don't think that if you made more just for the sake of making more money, you're going to be happy. That is definitely not the case. Materialism is a serious problem in our societies, especially in Western societies. And materialism comes with many dangers. To give you a few examples, one of the dangers of materialism, people who are too concerned with material objects, with things, with buying things, objects that they own, people who are too concerned about materialistic objects, these people, not only are they less happy than other people, but they tend to be more isolated. Materialism has this negative effect of isolating you. It makes you less resilient at times of crisis. When a tragedy happens, when you're suffering from a problem, 
Materialistic people, they tend to crumble much quicker. They collapse. They're not as resilient as others who are not as materialistic. And on top of that, science has demonstrated, research has showed that materialistic people, they're more prone to mental illnesses, psychological problems. So materialism is bad for you. It's dangerous to your well-being. In fact, they did a study on Ice, Iceland, Icelanders in the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Scientists did a study to see what happened with these people, you know, who lost their jobs, who lost a lot of their wealth. They came to the conclusion that those Icelanders who were not so concerned about the job that they lost, they were willing to help their communities, to find something productive to do. They didn't spend the next five, six years to simply regain what they lost. These people, people fared much better. They had a much better well-being than those people who were concerned with the economy, with the, lost, with the jobs that they lost, with the money that they lost. Those people had problems psychologically. They were not that stable. They were not content. They were not happy. So not only is it bad for you, but it's also bad for society. Materialistic people, they have a reduced sense of social responsibility. They are less likely to give back to their community. So materialism makes you suffer and makes your society suffer. It's bad for you and it's also bad for your society. We have to be aware of the dangers of materialism, brothers and sisters. It affects each one of us and it's affecting our children even more. Now what do we do in the face of all this materialism in our society? What can we do to insulate ourselves and our families? Number one, we have to be aware of what's making us materialistic. What is it that's driving materialism in our society? That's the world of what? The world of advertisement. The world of advertising plays a crucial role in making us very materialistic beings. Because let's face it, what do companies want? They want to make profits, that's all they're concerned about. You think they really care about anything else? Most companies, all they care about is making profits and to get you to spend. So they will bombard you with advertisements. Now here's what's interesting in the world of advertisements. In the past, companies would simply advertise their products. This is our product. These are the specifications. This is what it does. And you go and buy it. Nowadays, what are they doing? They're not really advertising a product only. What are companies doing? They are advertising a lifestyle in addition to that product. They are giving you the false impression that if you buy our product, you're going to be happy. You're going to have a wonderful life. You've seen all those ads, right? Even silly ads like beverages, okay, like Coca-Cola. You see them advertising a lifestyle, beautiful people drinking the soda, they're happy trying to fool your brain that if you get the soda and you drink it, you're going to be happy like them. You're going to be excited and wonderful and happy like they are. If you buy this car, you're going to be happy like this person who's being advertised with the product. They're trying to sell you a lifestyle. And what happens? People fall for it. People actually fall for it. They do accept that this is a lifestyle. They think if they get this product, their life will become better. Isn't this pathetic? For someone to think that my life will be more fulfilling, will be better, my lifestyle will be better if I simply get a piece of product, a material object. But this is what the world of advertising does to us. They trick us into falling for these tricks. Now, 
psycho, there's a psychology professor by the name of Tim, Tim Kasser. He has an interesting idea or suggestion so we can be more aware of materialism in our society and to see how these ads are affecting us. His recommendation is, Tim Kasser, he says for four days, and try this activity. Let your children try this activity. So they are also aware of how much they're being bombarded by advertising in society. His recommendation is that for four days, every ad that you run into, whether it's on the street, the billboards, the internet, at school, at work, a website that you're visiting, keep track of every advertisement that you run into. Have a small notebook in your pocket or on your phone. In your notes, make a note of every advertisement that's being advertised to you. And this is very practical. This psychology teacher is saying, do this for four days and you will realize how you are bombarded with ads from day till night. Hundreds of ads every day. This will make you aware. What am I being fed? What's being thrown at me? Am I accepting everything that's thrown at me or not? And then he encourages us to reduce our exposure to advertisements. If you watch two, three hours of TV every day, cut back on watching TV. Reduce that. Insulate yourself and your family. Avoid programs or apps that are loaded with you know, advertisements. They're loaded with ads. Try to avoid that. He says, after you do that, you'll find how peaceful you'll be after four days. Once you're aware and you try to protect yourself from all these ads being bombarded at you, you'll feel more at peace. You'll feel as if you have more control over your own life. Even your willpower will strengthen. So the number one point that we need to keep in mind is how we're exposed to advertisements. Never accept that an object can change your life. Don't fall for that. As much as that's being advertised to us. That's number one. Number two, and this is extremely important. This has to do with our shopping habits. If you examine our shopping habits in Western society, it's truly mind-boggling. Many of our youth, many of us living here in this society, when we get bored, what is one place that we go to? We go to the mall shopping, right? When you get bored, you go shopping. Now imagine our ancestors, if they would have seen us today, when we get bored, we go and do shopping, they would think we're crazy, right? Because you go shopping when you need something, not when you're bored. But our society has taught us, if you get bored, just go to the mall. And why do they build these fancy, wonderful malls? To get you to go there so they can gouge the money out of you, to seduce you into buying something from them, to lure you to buy something from them. To protect yourself, brothers and sisters, never go shopping because you're bored. That's ridiculous. If you're bored, there is so much to do in society. Go explore nature with your friends. Go to the park. Engage in a beneficial activity. Educational activity, social activity. Volunteer in your, in your community center. There's many things for you to do. If you find yourself bored, don't go shopping. Because once you do that, you have allowed yourself to fall into the trap of materialism. And by the way, my suggestion is, when you go shopping, don't go with your friends. Don't go with your friends when you go shopping. Go to the park, you know, go kayaking, do something interesting with your friends. Explore nature and appreciate the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you go and you want to buy something, don't go with your friends. Because when you go with your friends, you know how friends are. They see this shop, that shop, this product. They encourage one another to buy something. They compete against each other to buy something, to show off what they've bought. Simply avoid going to the mall with your friends. That's one way to protect yourself and your children from falling into the traps of materialism. 
Another point here is that go to the mall, go shopping when you need something. Many of us, you know how we are, we don't really need something. Let's go and see if we need something. What do you mean if we need something? You should know whether you need something or not. There are no ifs there and explorations there. Everybody knows if they need something or not. Let me go see if there is anything interesting, a new product. Whenever you find yourself thinking that way, know that you don't need it. If you really needed it, you would have known that you need it. We know what we need. So if you're not sure what you need and you're just going and exploring, if there's anything new, anything interesting, that's a red flag. That's an alarm there. Beware. Don't fall into the trap of materialism. The minute you go out there, you put your feet in that mall, that's it. They've got you. They've got you. The companies with their tactics, they have got you. They will make you buy something that you will not need. That's how it works. So in the beginning, make a commitment with yourself. I will only buy something that I need. Make a list. Before you go to the mall, make a list. One, two, three, four, five. I need these five things. Stick to your list. Go to the mall. Buy them and come back. Don't keep wondering what else do you need there. Because then you'll fall into the trap of materialism. And this, look, this does make you materialistic. If this is a permanent feature of my lifestyle, and every week, every month, I run into this, after a while you will find yourself in a materialistic state, away from God, you don't interact with spirituality, you read the Quran, it's not impacting you, you pray, it doesn't affect you, and you wonder why. Maybe I'm too materialistic, I'm too concerned with objects, material objects. So we need to keep this in mind. We have to be sure that our shopping habits are healthy. Keep shopping when it's necessary. When it's not necessary, avoid it. You don't have to go there. There's so many other things you can do in society. God has given you time. Time is more precious than gold. Use your time wisely. Now how do you know that you've fallen into the traps of materialism? Aside from... You know, some examples of shopping that I have shared with you. You know that you've fallen into the traps of materialism when you declutter your room. And I've got an exercise for all of you. Tonight, we'll be busy with Laylatul Qad. But in the upcoming nights, I ask everyone, go to your room and declutter it, clean it. See what you need and what you, know, what you don't need. Empty the drawers, the closet what you've been stuffing under your bed for all this time. Declutter your room and see how many things you have purchased and bought that are useless and you're not even using them. Try this and you'll see how many things you've bought, you really didn't need them. Every once in a while, six months, every year, every two years, when we declutter our room, clean our room, we realize there are so many things in the room that I have not even touched. Believe me, there are people, they will buy things. They will buy things, and I'm not exaggerating. They keep it in the room two years past, they did not touch that thing. Why? This is a waste of God's resources. Open our closets, see what's in your closet. See what's in people's closets. All those fabulous, wonderful clothes. Okay, if you wear them, you use them, that's fine. Allah will not hold you responsible for buying something and using it. But the reality is we don't use it. Some people, they have 20, 30 pairs of shoes, especially the sisters, right? And they don't wear them. Believe me, one, two, three, four years pass by, they will not touch 10 pairs of shoes. Okay, why did you buy them if you're not going to wear them, if you're not going to use them? All those dresses... Why did you buy them if you're not going to use them? Ask yourself tonight. See how much of the clothes that you have in your closet do you use? God is not going to hold me responsible for something that I used. Every night you wear something new, that's fine. God has given you, be thankful and use God's resources. But the Almighty God will hold you responsible 
for things you bought you did not use when there are people suffering in this world. When there are people who are in need in this world. God will hold us responsible. God will hold us accountable. The food that we waste, brothers and sisters, in our homes, in our community centers, even at the mosque, make sure not a grain of rice goes to waste. This is a problem that we see in our homes. When we waste food, this angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God might take the blessings away from our lives. Only put on your plate what you can eat. Don't pour something more into your plate and then you're stuck with it, you can't finish it, then you have to throw it away. This is unacceptable. There are people here in this society who are malnourished, who don't have this privilege of these foods that we have. The extra food, let's give it to them. And we need a system in our society. We need volunteers in our society who can come up with creative ways for all this food, instead of it being wasted, to be given to the poor people. There are many poor, poor people here in this society. We need to find a way, brothers and sisters. Let's be active. This is how we honor Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. Because Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was extremely sensitive even when it came to a single grain of rice. A single crumb of bread. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, would not waste. The Imam teaches us to be simple. The simpler your life is, the more humble you are, the less you waste, the happier you will be, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless your life. This is one of the blueprints of the life of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. You will not find anyone more humble than him. He was the commander of 50 countries on that, on that map. During his time, the Imam salam, in his four years of being a caliph, he ruled over 50 countries. Yet the Imam salam, had the most simple life. Do you know that in the last year of his life, he only had one garment, one garment. Even on Fridays when he had to come for the Friday prayer, he would often be seen flapping his garment against the wind, fluttering it. He would be asked, why? Why are you doing this? The Imam says, I only have one piece of garment. And on this day, on Friday, I washed it. I did not have any other garment to replace it. I washed it. I did not have enough time for it to dry out. So I came. It's still moist. I am flapping it to dry it in the wind. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. This is why till this very day we seek inspiration from him. Because he was the peak of humanity, of humbleness. How can we claim to be followers of this man when we don't care about the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us? Yes, it's okay to have a good house, a good car, to buy what you need. That's all fine. But make sure the world does not captivate your heart. Just like a ship. In order for a ship to sail, you need water, right? Can a ship move without water? The more water, the better. But what happens the minute the water goes inside the ship? What happens? The same water that carries the ship allows the ship to move. If it goes inside the ship, what happens? It sinks. The same with the world. The world is like the ocean. It's like water. It carries you. This world, the more resources you have, the better. But the minute the world captures your heart, the world, the materialistic world goes inside your heart, what does it do to you? You sink, just like the ship. And this is what Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, is demonstrating to us. That's why he led such a humble life. Don't let the world deceive you and distract you from God. If you find that the world is distracting you, then know that there is a problem. The food of Amir al-Mu'mineen was so humble. Once one of the governors whom Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, appointed, 
He came to visit him. The Imam told him, after you pray, the noon prayer, come and visit me. He went to visit him, it was lunchtime. So he thought, this is Amir al muminin the commander of the faithful, the caliph, the king, the ruler. He's probably going to have some fancy lunch. He saw that the Imam السلام, took out a container that was sealed, locked. He's like, wow, what kind of treasures is there in this container that he actually has to lock it? What is he going to eat? Caviar? What's in that jar? The Imam السلام, opened the jar and he saw some dry pieces of barley bread. That the Imam السلام, could barely chew. That's how hard it was. The man was shocked. He told him, Ali, I, I don't understand. Amir al muminin commander of the faithful. I don't understand. You're a generous person. You're not stingy for you to lock up your food so somebody doesn't steal it from you. There's so much food here in Iraq. The Imam السلام, said, no, you misunderstood me. That's not why I lock it in this container. The reason why I lock it in this container is because the bread is so hard. My two sons, Hassan and Hussein, they would bring some oil or some honey to mix it to make it soft for me. So I lock it so they don't do that. This is how I want to live. Like the poorest person in my society. I want to live like the poorest person. The man asked him, why is it haram? Is it impermissible for you to eat something good? The imam says, no, it's not haram. But I am a leader, even for the poor people. I want the poor people to know that I live like them. I feel their pain. I share them their lifestyle. I eat what they eat. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He teaches us, don't let the world concern you so much. The physical world, the materialistic world. There is a hadith from the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. It's a very beautiful hadith and it teaches us the limits of what materialism is. You can eat what you want, that's fine. And be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eat the best food. However, the Prophet in this hadith says... He shall not find the taste or the sweetness of faith. We all want the sweetness of faith, right? The Prophet says you will not achieve the sweetness of faith if you're concerned about what you eat. See, we all eat, we eat good foods, that's fine. But if you're too concerned about what you eat, some husbands, they go back home, if they don't like the food that they're Wives have cooked, it's the end of the world that day. We've seen how they react. They're angry, they're agitated because of some food. This person is not a true believer according to the Prophet. Or let's say he goes to the house that day, the wife was sick, she did not cook. Or it could be the other way around. These days the men are cooking, right? And the wives are coming back home expecting a meal from them. You go back home, there's no meal. Okay, it's not the end of the world. Are you going to die? What's going to happen? Maybe she was sick. Maybe she was busy with the kids. She had something to do. I've seen some men, I swear to God, they make an issue. They come, they yell, they scream. They give this nasty attitude to their wives. The Prophet says, if you want to achieve and taste the sweetness of faith, don't be so concerned. What food you ate? Anything that's given to you, say Alhamdulillah. Anything that's put on the table, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's live like Amir al muminin salamullah alayhi. We can't live like him, obviously. But let's try. On such nights, if we want to honor Amir al muminin alayhi salam, let's try to live like him. He was the symbol of humbleness. All prophets of God. In fact, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, he was the symbol of humility and humbleness. According to Islamic traditions, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, once said in a very beautiful narration, he says, I have nothing. 
My mode of transportation is not something fancy. It's my two legs, that's how I travel. And I don't sleep on a fancy pillow. My pillow are the rocks of the earth. That's my pillow. I don't even have a blanket. My blanket is the sky. I sleep under the sky. But then you know what he says? وَلَا يُوجَدْ أَحَدٌ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِ الْأَرْضِ أَغْنَى مِنِّي But there is no human being, no person on the face of the planet who is richer than me. I have nothing. If you look at me from a materialistic perspective, I've got nothing. Just my garment. He had a spoon, a bowl he'd eat from and that's it. He didn't have anything. But there is no one richer than me. Why? Why no one is richer than him? Because he was not in need of all this world. The more you're in need to this world, the more poor you are. The world makes you poor by enslaving you. It makes you need this world. So one way to secure ourselves from materialism, let's beware of our shopping habits, what we need, what we don't need. Let's be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next time you want to buy something, do something, think of all those millions of people who are suffering. Ask yourself, do I really need this? Is this necessary or no? That way you will achieve the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will follow into the footsteps of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Another very powerful way for us to protect ourselves from materialism is to give. The spirit of generosity. You can claim to be righteous all you want. The Quran is very clear. You shall not achieve righteousness until you give, not what you don't need, what you want to get rid of. Mimma tuhabun, that which you love, that which you like. Give that and donate it in the way of God. Share it with those people who are not as privileged as you are. That's how you achieve righteousness. خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا The Quran instructs the Prophet, take charity from the people because the charity will purify your heart. It will save you from the traps of materialism. Give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason... And I say this with confidence. One primary reason why Western societies have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because they give. The United States, yes, there's a lot of materialisms there. But do you know how much they give in a year? Americans donate $370 billion a year for charity. Of course God is going to reward us in this life if we do that. If it weren't for this, believe me, they'd be at the bottom of the list of nations that are happy. One reason why they relatively are happier than other nations is because of the spirit of generosity they give. Canadians in 2014, they gave about $12 billion in charity. And this brings blessings to our society. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, his life was based on charity. Even when he had nothing, he would offer it to those who are poor. We've all heard of the story when he was praying in his ruku' while he was bowing down, he gave his ring to the poor man. We've all heard of the story when the Imam salam for three days he would fast with his wife Fatima, with his two young sons Hassan and Hussein. And at the time for breaking his fast, he gave the bread to the poor, to the orphan, to the wayfarer. He gave everything away in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's one hadith that captures to us the spirit of generosity of Amir al muminin And it's been attributed to Abi Sa'id al-Khidri, one of the companions of the Prophet. According to this hadith, one day Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam was in his house and he asked his wife Fatima, Oh Fatima, is there anything for us to eat? Is there anything, any lunch, any dinner? She told him, Ya Amir al muminin it's been three days I have not eaten anything. The Imam said, Fatima, then why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me that we have no food? I would have tried to bring something to the table. 
She told him, oh Ali, I'm embarrassed. What do I tell you? I know you're struggling and we don't have anything. If I would tell you, I would just burden you more. The Imam السلام, is very disappointed. He's very upset that his wife has gone three days without any food. The Imam السلام, says, okay, I'll go outside. Let me see if I can borrow money from someone. This was in the early days of Medina when the society was very poor. And then later on, things changed. The Imam السلام, said, let me go outside. Let me see if I can bring something to my house. He goes outside. He borrows one dinar, which is one golden coin from someone. And he wants to go to the market to buy some food. As the Imam السلام, is going to the market, he sees Al-Miqdad ibn Al-Aswad. One of the great companions of Amir al muminin He sees Al-Miqdad al sitting at noontime under the hot sun, sitting very depressed. The Imam tells him, Oh Miqdad, what's wrong with you? Why are you sitting here under the sun? He says, Oh Amir al muminin Oh Ali ibn Abi Talib, don't ask me, please. Just keep it between me and God. He tells him, No, you're my brother in faith. I insist. Tell me, is there anything wrong? I'll help you. He says, no, Ali ibn Abi Talib, please don't ask me. The Imam insists. He tells him, look, you're my brother. I'm not going to leave you. I insist, tell me what's wrong. He says, oh Ali, I just came from my home. We have had nothing to eat for several days. My kids are crying. I couldn't handle hear my kids crying. So I left. I can't stay inside the house and see them in front of me like that. What did the Imam do? That one dinar that he just borrowed, he gave it to him. He told him, here, take this. You are in more need of this. The Imam السلام, gave up the only coin that he had. Now his pocket is completely empty. What does he do? The Imam can't go back home. How is he going to meet Fatima? Imagine the state, brothers and sisters, our Imam would go through this. Imagine going outside of your house, not knowing where to go. You can't go back home. You don't have the face to go back home. He doesn't know what to do. The Imam السلام, goes into the masjid. He rests for a while. He prays to God. Until the time of sunset, he doesn't go home. The Prophet comes. They pray jama'ah, the congregational sunset prayer. After the prayer, the Prophet calls Imam Ali. Come here, Ali. He tells him, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He tells him, am I invited tonight for dinner to your house? Is there anything we can go and eat? Let's go to your house and have dinner. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, knows there's nothing in the house. But he's embarrassed. What is he going to say? He remained quiet. He lowered his head. He remained quiet. The Prophet told him, Oh Ali, you're not going to invite me to your house? The Imam said, Ya Rasulullah, yes, come. Come to my house. Come, come for dinner to my house. He was embarrassed to tell him, there's nothing in my house. As they go to the house, and Imam Ali is worried. What is he going to do now? What is he going to tell the Prophet? And when there's nothing at home. When they went inside the house, Fatima al-Zahra had just finished her salah. The Imam realized that there is this amazing smell in the house, this delicious, fragrant food. The Imam was shocked. The Prophet told him, Yes, Ya Ali, let's now have dinner. The Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib looked at Fatima to Zahra. He told her, Oh, Fatima, you said three days there's nothing in the house. What's this delicious food in the pot? She told him, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, how do I know? I was praying, don't ask me. He looked at the Prophet. The Prophet said, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, I know what happened with you today. When you went outside and you gave that dinar to Al-Miqdad, Jibra'il came to me and he informed me of your altruism, your spirit of charity and generosity. And to compensate you for what you have given, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to bring down the food from fair, the food from paradise on Maryam alayhi salam, the mother of Jesus, he also today brought you a meal from paradise. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And the Prophet said, I am happy that God gave me the life 
to see how he honored my family like he honored Mary, the mother of Jesus, when he would deliver heavenly food to her, when she was in the sanctuary praying. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored Amir al muminin alayhi salam. The spirit of generosity, the more you give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you cleanse your heart from materialism. Give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the most recommended acts of Laylatul Qadr is to give in the way of Allah. And finally, brothers and sisters, the worship of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The best remedy to materialism is worshiping God. This man who would worship God every single night, every single day. Ali ibn Abi Talib lived on the worship of God. The energy that he would get was not from food. He'd barely eat anything. The energy that he would get was from worshiping the Almighty God. Narrations indicate for some time in his life, Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, every single night on the long winter nights, he would pray 1,000 rak'ah. This is Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام. He was infatuated with the love of God. The love of God had penetrated his heart. Let's take a quick glimpse at the ibadah of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Abu Darda, he says, one day I was in the Prophet's mosque discussing with the companions the virtues of the companions of the Prophet. I told them, in my opinion, the best of them, the most worshipping of them was Ali ibn Abi Talib. They said, why? How do you say that? You're not being objective. He said, I'll tell you something I myself witnessed. He said, I witnessed this with my own eyes. One night in the midst of the night, I was passing by the gardens, by the palm trees, when I heard a faint, when I heard a faint voice, a voice coming from behind the woods. I went to investigate what it was. I heard someone praying to God with such a broken voice in the midst of the night, in the darkness of the night, I heard, say, I heard someone say, Oh Allah, how many sins have you forgiven me? Oh God, how many evil acts that we commit and you cover them, you don't expose them. Then I came closer and I heard him saying, Ilahi la in tala fi asyanika umri. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib saying it. Oh Allah, if I have, if I have lived a long life sinning against you. This is Amir al Mu'minin saying this. What do we say, brothers and sisters? When our life is full of sins and we need to repent to God. Ilahi la in tala fi asyanika umri wa adhma fi sohfi dhanbi Oh Allah, when I know that my sin is very big in my book of actions and the records of my deeds Then the Imam alayhi salam begins to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he focuses our attention to the mercy of God فَمَا أَنَا بِمُؤَمِّلٍ غَيْرِ غُفْرَانِكَ وَلَا أَنَا بِرَاجٍ غَيْرَ رِضْوَانِكَ Oh God, when I see all these sins, I only have one hope, that you will forgive me. That you are the compassionate Lord who will forgive me my sins. He says then Ali ibn Abi Talib, he kept quiet. He started praying. I came to him, I saw that this was Ali ibn Abi Talib. When the Imam alayhi salam, he finished his salah, he continued speaking to God. Ilahi ufakkiru fi afwika fatahunu alayya khati'ati thumma adhkuru al-azima min akhdika fata'adhumu alayya baliyati he says, Oh Allah, when I think about your mercy, about your forgiveness, then even my greatest sins, I see them so small compared to your mercy. But then when I remember that you, O oh Allah, will hold me responsible, I will also know that my crime is huge. O oh Allah, just by the virtue that I sinned against you, 
that in itself is such a huge crime. Then the Imam began to say, Ahin Ahin Ana Karatu Fis Sahafi Sayyatan Ana Nasiha Wanta Muhsiha. O oh God, woe well upon me if on the day of judgment in the book of my deeds I read about a sin that I forgot about it. All those sins I committed and I did not repent, I forgot about them. But you, O oh Allah, you're the one who recorded everything. Oh God, who can save me on the day of judgment? Other than your mercy, other than your my good deeds, who can save me on the day of judgment? My family can save me, my tribe can save me. No one can save me from your punishment, oh God. Ahin ayah min nar tundjul akbad wal kila. Ahin ayah min nar nazaat al shawa. Then he begins to give us a vivid picture of the punishment of God. Abu Darda, the companion who's narrating this, he says, Then I suddenly saw Ali ibn Abi Talib collapse to the ground unconscious. I went, I touched him, I could not do anything for him. I thought Ali ibn Abi Talib is dead. I went running to his home to Fatima. I told her, Oh Fatima, I have to give you bad news. Your husband Ali is dead. She said, Why? How do you say that? He says, He was praying to God. He fell to the ground dead. I tried to wake him up. Wake him up. He's not waking up. She told him, Oh Abu Darda, don't worry. Ali ibn Abi Talib is not dead. This happens to him every night. Out of his love for God and fear of God, he falls every night unconscious. This is our Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Oh believers, now I want to take your hearts to the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the last night of our Imam Amir al muminin He was in that very difficult condition. The poison had now spread throughout his body. These are the final moments. The Imam, his head was split. Yet the Imam السلام, before his final moments, he has an advice for us, a, a message for us, his followers. You want to be a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Then listen to the final words of Amir al muminin And I tell you, this is nothing short of a miracle for someone to be struck on his head. His head is split open. Some parts of his brain are showing, yet he can give such advice. This is the miracle of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now take your hearts to the room. Of Amir al Mu'minin. Qala Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam, Layla al Hadi wal Ashreen, Leauladihi wa Ashab, Bil Amsi ana sahibukum, Wal Yoma ana ibratun lakum, Wagadan ana mufarikukum. The Imam gathered all of his family members and companions around him. He told them yesterday, I was living amongst you just like you. And today I am a lesson for you and tomorrow I shall be departing you. Then the Imam السلام, begins his wasiyah, his will. قَالَ أُوصِيكُمَا بِتَقْوَى اللَّهِ وَأَنْ لَا تَبْغَيَ الدُّنْيَا وَإِنْ بَغَتْكُمَا my will for you is to be mindful of God, is to have piety and don't run after the world, even if the world runs after you. And don't be so disappointed if there are some things in life that you cannot get. And always say the truth and work for the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكُونَا لِلظَّالِمِ خَصْمًا وَلِلْمَظْلُومِ عَوْنًا And always be against the oppressors 
and always be a support for those who are oppressed. Make sure that people in your society who are oppressed, you stand up for their rights. أوصيكم أبتا أوصيكم بتقوى الله ربكم ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أوصيكم بإصلاح ذات بينكم فإني سمعت رسول الله يقول صلاح ذات البين أفضل من عامة الصلاة والصيام my next advice to you, O oh people, always bring conciliation amongst yourselves, amongst your family members. If there are people fighting with each other on bad terms, make peace between people. For I heard the Prophet say that the one who brings reconciliation between two people, it is better than praying and fasting. Allah, Allah, fil aytam, fala taghubu afwahahum, wala yadi'u bihadratikum. Be mindful of God when it comes to the orphans. Make sure the orphans in your society, they're not lost. Take care of the orphans. Allah, Allah, fil Qur'an, fala yasbiqannakum ila al-amali bihi ghayrukum. Be mindful of God when it comes to the Qur'an. Make sure others do not beat you in implementing the Qur'an. Make sure others don't implement the Qur'an before you do. You Muslims be the first to implement the Book of God. Allah, Allah, fi jiranikum Fa'inna Rasool Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi awsa bihim Hatta dhananna annahu sayuarrithuhum be mindful of God when it comes to your neighbors. The Messenger of God used to advise us, take care of your neighbors such that we thought they're going to receive our inheritance. There are a literal part of our family. Allah, Allah, fa salah, ayyuhal muali la tudayya salat. Allah, Allah, fa salah, fa innaha amudu deenikum. Be mindful of God when it comes to your prayers. It's the pillar of your faith. Make sure that you don't neglect your prayers. Allah, Allah, fi fa'innaha tutfi'u ghadab rabbikum. Be mindful of God when it comes to charity, for it extinguishes the anger of God when you give charity. And then the Imam alayhi salam begins to give his wasiyah. And then the Imam alayhi salam says, As for the one who has struck me and killed me, O oh my family members, I don't want you going out in the city fighting people and tribes saying that our father is killed. No. Just the one who killed me, if you want to seek retribution from him, then after I die. But as long as I am alive, look at the compassionate hearts of Amir al Mu'mineen. As long as I am alive, even the one who struck me and is going to kill me, I want you to give from the food that you give me. Give him the best food, give him water, be gentle with him. He came to kill the Imam and the Imam is being gentle with him. This is the compassionate heart of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. But now the moment of death is drawing closer, O believers. ثُمَّ عَرْقَ جَبِينُهُ فَجَعَلَ يَمْسَحُ الْعَرْقَ بِيَدِهِ Then the Imam alayhi salam, he began to sweat. His forehead began to sweat. فَقَالَتْ إِبْنَتُهُ زَيْنَبِ يَا أَبَا أَرَاكَ تَمْسَحُ جَبِينَكَ Zainab, his daughter said, my father, why is it that you're wiping your forehead? Why are you sweating? What happened? You know what he told her? I heard your grandfather saying, O oh Zainab, that the true believer, when he is about to die, then he begins to sweat, his forehead begins to sweat. This is what's happening, Zainab, I'm dying. <laughs> Zainab alayhi salam, she collapses on the Imam alayhi salam, she begins to cry, he tries to comfort her. ثُمَّ نَظَرَ إِلَىٰ أَوْلَادِهِ فَرَآهُمْ تَكَادُ تَزْهَقُ أَرْوَاحُهُمْ مِنْ شِدَّةِ الْبُكَاءِ وَالنَّحِيمِ 
He looked at his sons. They were about to die from crying. قال لهم أحسن الله لكم العزاء ألا وإني منصرف عنكم وراحل في ليلتي هذه ولاحق بحبيبي محمد Oh my dear family, this is the time of farewell. I'm leaving tonight and I will join your grandfather, the Prophet, peace be upon him. كما وعدني فإذا أنا مت يا أبا محمد فغسلني وكفني وحنطني ببقية حنوط رسول الله فإنه من كافور الجنة Oh my son Hassan, when I die I want you to put me in my kafan, in my shroud and I want you to take from the camphor that was placed in the kafan of the Prophet and put it also in my shroud as you're burying me. ثُمَّ ضَعْنِي عَلَى سَرِيرِي وَلَا يَتَقَدَّمْ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ مُقَدَّمَ السَّرِيرِ وَاحْمِلُوا مُؤَخَّرَهُ وَاتَّبِعُوا مُقَدَّمَهُ Then the Imam says, when you are carrying my body, then follow the path. On the other side, the angels will carry my body. Follow the path to my grave. وَصَلِّ عَلَيَّ يَا بُنَيَّ يَا حَسَنْ وَكَبِّرْ عَلَيَّ سَبْعًا وَاعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا يَحِلُّ ذَلِكَ لِأَحَدٍ غَيْرِي إِلَّا لِرَجُلٍ يَخْرُجُ آخِرَ الزَّمَانِ اسْمُهُ الْمَهْدِي مِنْ وَلْدِ أَخِيكَ الْحُسَيْنِ Then, O oh Hassan, when you're praying on me, the prayer of the dead, I want you to do seven takbiras, not five, which is normally done. Only this is an exception for me and the Mahdi. They will also do seven times takbira on him when he passes away. Then the Imam alayhi salam, he begins to explain to them how to bury him. And according to Islamic traditions, the grave of Imam Ali in Najaf, it was prepared by Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Prophet Noah, before the flood happened, he prepared the grave for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He showed his sons where that grave is to bury him in that grave. ثم أخذ يودع أولاده الواحد بعد الآخر حتى أغمي عليه ساعة وأفاق وقال هذا رسول الله وعمي حمزة وأخي جعفر وأصحاب رسول الله كلهم يقولون عجل قدومك علينا فإنا إليك مشتاقون Oh my dear sons, now I can see the Prophet. I can see my uncle Hamza. I can see Ja'far. They're all waiting for me. They tell us, Oh Ali, we miss you. Hurry. Come to us. We're waiting for your soul. ثم أدار عينيه في أولاده وأهل بيته وقال أستودعكم الله جميعا وحفظكم الله جميعا الله خليفتي عليكم وكفى بالله خليفة He begins to farewell his family with these very emotional words ولم يزل وهو بتلك الحال يسبح الله ويذكره كثيرا The last thing on his lips was remembering God. He was mentioning the name of God these final moments before he passed away. ثم استقبل القبلة Oh believers, here comes the tragedy. These are the final moments of Imam Ali's life. The Imam turned to the direction of the Qibla. وَقَالَ أَشْهَدُ أَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ رِفْقًا بِي يَا مَلَائِكَةَ رَبِّي Oh angels, be gentle with me. Be gentle with the soul of Ali ibn Abi Talib. لِمِثْلِ هَذَا فَلْيَعْمَلِ الْعَامِلُونَ ثُمَّ عَرِقَ جَبِينُهُ وَسَكَنَ أَنِينُهُ وغمض عيني وأسبل يدي ومد رجلي Oh believers! 
gosh, this is the moment. The Imam closes his eyes, he rests his hands and feet. حسين ما تم مصيام <تصفيق> اجل عيد واولاد يتام they didn't let Amir al-Mu'mineen finish his fasting in the month of Ramadan the month of Allah they struck him with the sword انا لله وانا اليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين